Toast. Did you hear that? Toast. Good evening, everyone. We thank you for coming out to our meeting tonight. We'll ask the um, clerk to announce the meeting and call the roll. Roll call, Walters. Here. Philbrook. Bynum. Here. Walker. Here. Townsend. Here. McKiernan. Here. Mukia. Here. Johnson. Here. Kane. Here. Markley. Here. Holland. Here. All right. Tonight, the um, invocation is being given by Sister Therese Bangert of Our Lady and St. Rose Catholic Church. We ask you to rise and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Tuesday night was the first listening session of Mayor Holland and the Commission, and it was in my district, District 1. People came. They filled the parking lots, they filled the chairs, and they sat down in groups and talked and listened. With this introduction, I invite you to bow our heads in prayer. God of our fathers and mothers and Lord of mercy, in your wisdom you have established human persons to govern this community, this state, in holiness and justice. Thank you for the wisdom of these leaders to provide opportunities to listen to the dreams and the opinions of the members of this community. Give them the extra strength and energy that such listening demands. Lead the work of this meeting tonight by the grace of your wisdom. And Lord of mercy, we pray for our neighbors in Texas and Oklahoma who are suffering because of the storms. Comfort them and help their leaders make good decisions for them. We pray too for the Kansas legislators who need your wisdom to lead them to solutions for our state and all of us. We lift our hearts and the concerns that we carry to you. And I pray in the name of our brother Jesus, amen. amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Yes, any planning and zoning. All right, thank you, Sister Therese, for your prayer tonight. And we have two distinct parts of our meeting. The planning and zoning part will be handled first, following by our regular commission meeting. Before we begin planning and zoning, I'll ask the clerk if there are any revisions to tonight's agenda. There are no revisions. All right, I will now um, ask the clerk to read the statement and followed by any items on the planning and zoning consent agenda. We would like to welcome all present to this meeting of the Unified Government Commission. Members of the commission are Mayor Mark Holland, Commissioner Melissa Bynum at Large District 1, Commissioner Hal Walker at Large District 2, Commissioner Gail Townsend, District 1, is joining us via phone, Commissioner Brian McKiernan, District 2, Commissioner Ann McGee, District 3, Commissioner Harold Johnson, Jr., District 4, Commissioner Mike Kane, District 5, Commissioner Angela Markley, District 6, Commissioner Jim Walters, District 7, and Commissioner Jane Fieldbrick, District 8, is unable to be here. As each petition is called this evening, all persons for or against will be given the opportunity to express their views. If this is the first time that a particular petition has been before this commission, the commission has three options. Number one, it can approve the recommendation of the Planning Commission with six votes. Number two, it can override the Planning Commission's recommendation, but it would take eight votes to override. And number three, 
it can return the matter to the Planning Commission for further consideration together with the statement specifying the reason for referring back to the Planning Commission. The consent agenda is the first part of the Planning and Zoning agenda. Items on the consent agenda have received a unanimous vote or recommendation by the Planning Commission. Unless there is a request to set aside an item from the consent agenda by the applicant, a member of the public, the Unified Government Commission, or staff, then the Planning Commission's recommendation on all items on the consent agenda will be adopted by the Unified Government Commission at one time. I will read the list of agenda items on the consent agenda, and when I have completed the list, the mayor will ask if there are any requests to set aside items from the consent agenda. This is your time to stand up and request that an item be set aside if you do not agree with the Planning Commission's recommendation. If an item is set aside, the matter will be discussed and voted upon separately. All items not set aside will be approved by the Planning Commission's recommendation. We appreciate the attendance of those people here this evening and we recognize the importance of each petition. We would remind you that there are a number of items on the agenda and we'd appreciate your efforts to make your remarks as concise as possible. We ask that anyone with a cell phone to please turn them off or switch to non-audio so you will not disturb the meeting. Once the petitioners make their presentation, anyone for or against will be allowed the maximum five minutes to state your views. As you come to the microphone, please state your name and city for the record. The mayor and commission are required to disclose contacts with proponents or opponents on any item on the planning and zoning agenda. I will ask if any members of the commission wish to disclose any contact with proponents or opponents on any item on the agenda. Commissioner McKiernan. I've had communication with uh, proponents of item A1 on the consent agenda and proponents of item A1 on the non-consent agenda. Commissioner Walker. Um, I need to state that I am a board, unpaid board member of ONDA uh, for item A2, the change of zone. But I've don't recall having any contact from anybody on that board about that. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Kane. Thank you, Mayor. The non consent agenda petition SP 2014 80, both opponents and proponents, and on uh, petitions uh, SP 2015 24, an opponent. Thank you. Commissioner Bynum. I've had contact with proponents on the non-consent agenda item SP 2014-80. Thank you. Um, I also have had uh, contact with proponents of A1 um, and I've had um, proponents and opponents from A1 on the non-consent agenda as well. All right, I see no further disc uh, disclosures. Now I'll read the items on the consent agenda. Changes on application item number 13085, Unified Government Board of Commissioners, rezone properties covering an area on 6th Street from Taromi to Split Log from C3, commercial district to either CD Center District District or a traditional neighborhood design district, recommended for approval to TND District. Item two. Item 3086, Therese Gardner with ONDA. Changes on R1B, single family district to RT2B, two family district to construct a duplex for seniors at 4014 Strong Avenue. Recommended for approval. Item 3, 3087, Richard Muller, Van Trust Real Estate LLC. Changes on from CP2, Plant General District Business to BP, Plant Business Park District for Dairy Farmers of America. Global Headquarters at 1405 North 98th Street, recommended for approval. Special Use Permit Application Item 1, SP 2015-17, Lonnie Wash, Renewal of a Home Occupation Special Use Permit for a Barbershop at 4001 Oakland Avenue, recommended for approval for five years. Item 2, SP 2015-19, Steve Bowmount, KCA 
LP, doing business as Chateau Avalon, special use permit for live entertainment at 701 Village West Parkway, recommended for approval for two years. Item 3, SP 2015, Michael Morris, quick auto salvage and tow, renewal of a special use permit for an auto salvage yard and police at 1124 Pontiac Avenue, recommended for approval for five years. Those are all items on the consent agenda. Thank you. I would now ask if any member of the commission or anyone in attendance tonight wishes to set aside any item on the planning and zoning consent agenda. If an item is not set aside, all remaining items will be voted on by a single vote following the recommendation. Move for approval. Second. Let the record show no one is moving forward to set an item aside. It is. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, that would be one. You may come forward to the microphone. Thank you. You're real good, so I'm sorry. Would you like to set aside number three for quick auto shit salvage? All I know is I'm a, I'm a middleman of all this, and I was sent up. So uh, it is, rec sir, I'll just help out. It's recommended for approval. If you do nothing, it will be voted on by the commission in a single vote, and it will follow the recommendation of this board, which is for approval. If you do not support approval, then you would want to pull it off and speak against the motion. But if you want them to get their special use permit, it's on the consent agenda for approval. Okay. Do you want them to get their special use permit? Yes. Okay, then I'd leave it right where it is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, let the record show no one moved forward to remove an item from the consent agenda. It is properly moved and seconded. Roll call. Roll call Walters. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Walker. Aye. Townsend. Aye. McKiernan. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Kane. Aye. Markley. Aye. The vote is 8 to 0. That motion carries. Those items have all been approved. That brings us to the planning and zoning non-consent agenda. Let me get to my spot. And our first item is item A1, um, Ryan Dink. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ryan Dink, McEnany Van Cleveland Phillips, address 10 East Cambridge Circle Drive, Kansas City, Kansas 66103. I'm here representing the applicant, the wine barn, um, and specifically the uh, applicants are Scott and Denise Hyatt and Brian and Celeste uh, McAnnes. Um, you know, I don't have a lot to add from what happened at the Planning Commission. Uh, we are in agreement with all of the stipulations. Uh, the only thing I would add is that we did have a meeting with Mr. Richardson uh, yesterday where we went through and discussed and agreed upon all of the, the, the fencing and, and everything that was going to be uh, laid out there. So really, I just stand for any questions. All right. Um, what I might do is go ahead and open the public hearing and invite proponents and opponents to come forward. And then after we have heard the public comment, the presenter will have an opportunity to respond if you would like and then I'll open it up for commission comment um, so I will now open the public hearing and I would ask everyone who is in favor of this application to please come forward at this time to speak is there anyone who would like to speak in favor when did this come in Um, we do have an email that came in. I haven't even read it. Um, is it a it's, support? It's it is, it is from Rachel and Jeff Miskic, and they support uh, the application. Uh, some, there's a bit of dialogue about uh, having heard that they were in opposition, and she wanted to make clear that they were not in opposition and that they favored it. Okay. But we can ask the clerk to and put this in the official We'll ask the clerk to please enter that into the official record. I see no one else stepping forward as a proponent. Um, are there any opponents of this special use permit? Would you please come forward at this time? Anyone opposed?
Let the record show I see no one stepping forward to speak. We will now close the public hearing and I will open it to the commission. Commissioner Kane. Thank you, Mayor. I, I guess I am a little bit frustrated. I've worked on this project more than I worked on the development of 110th and Parallel where there's 2,000 jobs. We put staff through the ringer, multiple phone calls, a phone call from the Republicans, which I didn't like at the state level, asking me what I'm doing and why I'm not protecting the wine barn. I've never been opposed to the wine barn. And all, there's one thing in common that's happened. With the, the, we, go, we have a fight. We're at the school and we fight. We settle that fight, we get done, we go back, and we say we're going to do it this way. And then we get stipulations that you guys were given to say you got to do it this way. And then your comments were that wasn't the way we see it. So now we have new neighbors move in, and then there's another fight. And they say don't, they don't like this and they don't like that. And then I make a recommendation about uh, putting up three panels of fence, which is in the, the record there, so nobody can see it. It'll help with, with uh, noise protection. I want you to thrive out there, but what you're going to do this time, and I mean this, because this is the last time I'm going to ask the commission to support this, you're going to follow it to the letter of the law every single time, every single meeting, everything that you do out there, and if you don't do it, I'll be the first one that comes out there and says we're done. And it may not make it till December. With that being said, I make a motion that we push it forward, and if they do something wrong, it's, we're going to we're going to remove it. Second. All right, it has been moved and seconded. I would like to um, ask, because Commissioner Kane, I, I think you're accurate. I have been an advocate of the wine barn. Um, I have also been an advocate of working out the situation with the neighbors. Um, we did have a number of stipulations for the previous one. Mr. Uh, Richardson, in your opinion, were the stipulations met for the last special use permit? For the period of the previous approval, I don't believe that the stipulations were complied with. And how long was that previous approval given for? One year. They had a one-year special use permit, and they had stipulations in there that included things like, do you recall off the top of your head what the previous stipulations were? Um, they were very similar to the 14 that are included this time. Um, there were a couple of others that we've uh, removed for they've already been done um, but they held, I believe there were more live music events than were allowed um, and um, there's testimony from the neighbors at different occasions that the sound level may have been above what it was supposed to be and um, those are the two that I could recall off the top of my head mayor okay I am um it is troubling, and I share Commissioner Kane's frustration because we've spent a lot of time on the wine barn, and it is frustrating when we do offer a special use permit in good faith for a year, and then those stipulations are not met. It's also frustrating that I learned that you were cited um, for the theft of water from a fire hydrant, um, formally cited for that, and paid a fine to the Board of Public Utilities, um, using the water apparently to water the vineyard. Um, I know there are other allegations about that that are unsubstantiated, but it bothers me that we go to bat to try to get you a special use permit. I know Commissioner Kane specifically has spent a lot of his personal time on site trying to negotiate a settlement uh, that would be acceptable to the neighbors and to you, and the stipulations aren't met, and there are other issues as well. Um, I don't know of many other circumstances when people don't meet the stipulations that they're given that they actually get a renewal of a special use permit. Um, this is for six months. I will say I was sympathetic to the issue that even despite having a special use permit, you booked weddings. Um, and because I participate in weddings often, um, I'm sympathetic to not tell brides that the group screwed up and shouldn't have booked weddings, that they didn't have permission to book. Um, though I wasn't the, I know that it would be my phone that rang if I told the brides that they didn't get their have their wedding um, and I didn't want that um, and I think there was a negotiated settlement for six months I'm very hesitant to support this just because it has not felt from my perspective to be um, a good faith effort that has been given by others and so I think the six months to get you through the summer I know you have some weddings 
Um, I personally don't want to cancel weddings. Um, I think that's problematic. Um, but I also think that if these stipulations aren't met, we don't have to wait six months to pull this permit. And I personally will not hesitate as well to pull the permit by the end of the summer if it's not met. It's enormously frustrating and you use up a lot of goodwill when we've worked genuinely to work with you um, and to not, to not make that happen. So I'll make the same statement. It has been moved, properly moved and seconded, um, but I wanted to make that statement before we voted. Roll call. Roll call. Walters? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Walker? Aye. Townsend? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Mugia? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Kane? Aye. Markley? Aye. The vote is 9 to 0. That motion carries. All right. That brings us Thank to you. our next item, um, item number 2, SP 2015-21. Mr. Richardson, do you want to present this? I believe the applicant is here, Mayor. Okay. Hi, I'm Tara Knight, and I live at 6730 Speaker Road in Kansas City, Kansas. And all I'm asking for is permission to have between four and eight chickens so that I can use them as sort of therapy with some of the special needs foster children that I have coming in and out of my home, and um, also math and other things. I'm here on good faith because I know that if I don't get a permit that I'm breaking the law. And KDHE is in my home quite often, so are all the other foster care agencies, and I like to stay legal. All right. Um, we will open the public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience tonight who would like to speak in favor of this petition? Anyone who would like to speak in favor? Okay. Um, let the record show no one's stepping forward to speak in favor. Is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition? Come to the microphone, please, if you'd like to speak in opposition. Hi. My name. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for giving me the opportunity to speak and give my opinion why I disapprove of the chicken manure project. I, uh, my husband and I both are not in good health. My husband has congestive heart failure, and this chicken manure co coop um, is healthy. I mean, it's not healthy to the heart. It can cause sickness if it's not cleaned up like it's supposed to be. It, um, it uh, has antibiotic-resistant bacteria. It's also found in chicken manure. The bacteria is called stepho, lot, I can't say the word step, S T A P H Y L O C O C C I, and inner O C C O C O C C I. When these bacteria affect the food or water supply of humans, it can infect the digestive system of people. I have asthma. I have allergies. My husband has congestive heart failure. We both are, we've been there 50 years. We live at 6726 Speaker Road, Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, we built the house in 1965, and we take care of our property. And yes, we did have animals at one time, back in the, um, uh, what is it that, uh, grandfather's clause? And we had several. Um, we had chickens and everything, but we always cleaned up everything. Every night, every day, we fed them right. We took care of them. We had peacocks. We had guineas. We had wild turkeys come to our house. There was a lot of predators around the area. Um, there's raccoons. There's foxes. There's deer. There's wild turkeys. And... Um, I am an opposed, me and my husband, because this is going to make our value of our house go down just because somebody wants to put chickens in. And 
I have no problem of the chickens being put in if they were put in the right area of the uh, acre of ground. But no, they have to be right in behind her house, and she only plans, Mrs. Harrison only plans, or Harrison only plans to move them once a month. Well, once a month is going to bring a lot of stink. There's going to be flies. There's, there's going to be enough mosquitoes as it is because of the weather. Um, the flies stink. We get stink from that house as it is because of the septic tank. Um, we've been there, like I said, we've been at our house 50 years. We've watched water go under that house and out the front. Um, it... Um, is on a slab of concrete and it has no basin it has a crawl space we've been we've seen a lot and the weeds are constantly growing up all the time uh, i have no problem with mrs harrison wanting these chickens but they should be in the right place and they're not and i'm not gonna we're not gonna have to we have two houses on Speaker Road. We do not want to have to deal with this. We deal with enough from this lady, and I don't want any. I don't want any problems. I want to live my golden years in peace, and we're not been able to live our years in peace because since she's moved in in 1997, 98, we've had nothing but problems. She's stalking me all the time with a camera, and I don't appreciate that because, for the simple reason, I shelter cats because I take them in and I take care of them. I get them their shots. I, they come to my house. I take them in. I don't want to see them killed. I love animals. I always have, and I have no problem against these chickens, except I don't want all this stink. I don't want all this other stuff. We've got an acre and three quarters uh, to our house. And you know, when we had chickens and stuff, we put it to where it didn't bother nobody. You have one and, minute, ma'am. Okay, thank you. And um, so it's, you know, it's what whatever, but I don't feel that it should be put next to our house like it is. I thank you very much for listening, and I appreciate it very much. May we have your name for the record? Yes, it's Francis Jones. Thank you, Ms. Jones. We okay. appreciate your coming out tonight. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in opposition to this proposal? Let the record show I see no one else coming forward to speak in opposition. We will close the public hearing. We will give the applicant an opportunity to respond if you would care to to the statements that were made. The only response I have is, as we discussed in the last meeting, the chicken coop will not be arranged anywhere near her property. It will be on the opposite side. It is moved once a month to stop the erosion and to make sure that there's fresh grass. It will be cleaned. It will be maintained. It will be inspected. And um, if the chickens are causing issues, I would also announce that so do cats and so do the 25, 30 turkeys we have in our backyard every night. So that's it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. What do you say? Can I Where, come on? Yeah, he wants one of those turkeys. He's only interested in season. Oh, okay. It's in season. All right. I didn't know there was a season. Is there? <laughs> All right. We'll now close this public hearing. Um, and we are, the recommendation is for approval on a seven to one vote. Is there a motion? Commissioner Bynum. So moved. Second. It has been properly moved and seconded for approval. Seeing no further comment. Can, I have a question. Okay. Can you please? Yes, sir. The proponent, you, you stated it was going to be inspected. Who, who in, exactly? in that, I'm working with 4-H chicken program to help me make sure that I'm doing it right. I've never had chickens. Um, so they're coming out once a month to make sure that I'm doing it right and working with the children. Um, Katie, like I said, I'm a foster parent. Every kid I have in my home has somebody who comes to my home once a month. Some kids have nurses. They have physical therapy. 
occupational therapy. So what I'm saying is there are state personnel in my home minimum of four times a month that if there's an issue, KDHE will be called in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, Commissioner McKiernan. I just have one question, and I, I don't know. What's the physical relationship of the house of the woman who just spoke to your house? Sir, if you'll look at the um, video, my house is on the left. Yes. Next to the 200 empty acres, and her house is to the right. Thank you. So, Commissioner, the, the way she's described it, the coop would move up and down this tree line on, this, on the always west always side on of the, the property. Side. What's the frontage of that lot, Rob, do you know? I'm looking for the measure tool, just it's, I believe it's 175 across, or 150 across and 375 deep. Great, thank you. Commissioner Walker. Well, Mayor, as you know, we do have a chicken expert on this commission, oh, correct? <laughs> Perhaps we should yeah, ask uh, Commissioner Merguia to weigh in on the... <laughs> So I have three chickens, as Commissioner Walker has announced. I also have a special use permit. Um, I, I don't have any smell. Um, my unit's not even mobile. Um, it stays in the same spot. I have no smell, and as long as there's no rooster, there's no the noise. Um, hens don't make any noise. Um, I don't know if you know that. Uh, that's not been the lessons of my life. <laughs> <laughs> We are talking I would, about ask, I would ask the clerk to strike that comment from the record, please. Um, so I have, I, I, I think that, you know, it's an admirable thing you're doing. Um, they're probably not going to be a fraction of the work that the children you take care of are. All right. It has been properly moved and seconded. We do have a, a motion on the floor. Roll call. Roll call. Walters. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Walker. Aye. Townsend. Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Mugia? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Kane? Aye. Markley? Aye. The vote is 9 to 0. That motion carries. All right. That brings us to item number A3, um, special use permit for a cemetery at 8350 Leavenworth Road. Um, I will ask uh, the proponent to please come forward and make presentation. One for everybody. Okay. G'day, Will Anderson, BHC Roads, 901 North 8th Street, Kansas City, Kansas, representing the Azara Centre Inc. in their um, petition for a private cemetery at their location at 8350 Leavenworth Road, Kansas City, Kansas. So that's just the front special use, use permit application. Whoops. Um, that's just an aerial view of the as there are centre. Um, you can see the building at the front. The, um, the yellow, the red bounded yellow box is the uh, location of the, the proposed private cemetery in the back. Um, one of the questions we had had is whether the cemetery is visible from Leavenworth Road. As you can see, the ground rises away. You can just see the building between the trees and the cemetery is behind that. Um, some of the things that we had to do when we came together was, uh, is there a reverse on this? I'm left-handed. Okay, there we are. Should be the next one, I guess. Oh, you might have been right. Okay, thanks. 
So the things that we had to look at were whether we were compliant or in compliance with the, for the private cemetery within the, both the unified government and the actual Kansas state requirements. Uh, the things that we've stated before are where all our efforts are being complying with the Kansas State Board of Mortuary Arts. Uh, one of the issues with private cemeteries is what happens in the long term if the, the uh, congregation moves on or the church shifts and uh, what we put in place or putting in place is uh, an account that's uh, shared or signatures shared with both the UG and uh, a member of the Azara Centre Board. For each plot that's available, uh, there'll be a $500 uh, kept for that. And if you look at 150 plots, we're up at $75,000. So for long-term care on, the, on a small private cemetery, this is fairly good. Um, the pots need to be able to be defined by the recorded plant. So they're all able to be defined by the recorded plant. The recorded plant is a second part of this um, effort. Um, cemetery rules and regulations have been established. At, at this stage, they're just at an early stage and in some of the handouts you'll see the rules that they have currently got in place. And one of the other things we did was did soil samples, a geotech evaluation to make sure that A, we could bury the bodies and um, secondly, what were the aspects of the, the land itself. Okay, so the yeah, how do you go reverse again? America, you know, it's all different to me. I was going to ask if your uh, accent was from Muncie. Yeah, <laughs> further south. Further south, okay. Okay, so the second part of the the investigation was really to see whether we could meet the requirements of the Az Zara Center community. Um, it's an Islamic. Um, congregation and they do have some requirements. So the Islamic burial, and you can see that in one of the handouts that we've given you, that all plots are aligned to Mecca. We needed to meet a, a need for 150 plots and if you can average that out, in the past two years the congregation and the, the cemetery is limited to those people that are members of the congregation or their close family. We figure that for a year, four for two years, we'll put that out to about 75 years. So the, we don't expect that to be go out of play. One of the things was all the plots are the same size, four foot by ten foot. Um, it has to be easy to maintain. They're a, a community organisation, so even the headstones are laid flat with the surface. They just stick a little bit above the, the actual ground level so they can maintain that. The other thing is that the actual area for the cemetery is set back from each of the adjoining boundaries by 25 foot and there will be landscape between the boundary and the actual cemetery itself. Not only to provide privacy for the, the neighbours but also to, for the cemetery itself. Uh, okay, so one of the things that we wanted to get across was the fact that it, this has been a long process. Our initial meeting with Azara Centre was back in September of 2012. We met not long after that with Rob Richardson just to discuss what we were trying to get to do, just to make sure that we could comply with what he felt was the, the issue. The meeting was essentially between Pete Peterson, a long time attorney in the, in the Wyandotte area, and myself and, and Rob Richardson. We then basically put together a team to just go back and look at the, all the requirements that we might need, both from the local government, the state government, and the Azara community itself. Um, so the Azara Centre Board provided a, a member who's here, Mr Agar, um, to add comments. We went through the process initially, and then as part of our process, we um, obtained a neighbourhood listing from the UG planning department of all those people that were likely to be asked as a result of the formal application process. We held a, um, a neighbourhood meeting in effect um, and the, we had some neighbours come along. The people we invited along to answer questions included um, Pete Peterson from the attorney side, 
uh, Joel Brinkley from the funeral director's side, the Azara Centre Board. We also invited along Chris McCord, uh, a local appraiser, because there was some concern about whether the value, property values would be affected by this application. Um, we answered all the questions that they had um, and then moved forward. On those concerns, we further developed the requirements, removed, determined the information gaps, followed through with the, um, the geotech work and then entered into the formal application process earlier this year. There, at the Planning Commission, there were questions raised about the property value. There was a, a letter from an apartment across the road from the Az Zara Centre. Um, I asked Chris McCord, who's an appraiser in this area, for comments. He's provided comments on that, on the, the letter, and basically saying that there should be little or no effect for the property values in the surrounding area. There were some questions regarding the geotech information, whether there was water within the, where was the water table. The geotech drilled to 10 feet in, loca in about eight or nine locations around the, the area. They found no standing water. There was moisture in the soil. It is a clay soil, but basically the interest for us is that there was nothing that would stand out, especially the water table. Um, Long-term maintenance was a concern, and as I said, we, each of the, the plots will come up with a $500 that will go into escrow and be under the control, long-term control, which handles that. The, the cemetery itself, or the proposed cemetery, should be easy to maintain, and the Azara Centre currently maintain their property in a good condition. Compliance with state requirements, there were some questions about whether we complied or not. We have stated that we comply with state requirements. Um, we have a funeral director, general cemetery manager on the team, and he advised us and kept us in, online for what we may or may not have to do. Um, part of that is in one of the handouts, we've set aside a procedure that um, he has set up basically to say this is how they run, they would run, and how the Azara Centre basically takes part in that procedure. And the final was the Islamic burial rituals, and you can see on the back page of that same thing the, the basic requirements for those um, rituals. Um, our next steps are obviously to seek approval from the, by this commission. We need, if we get approval, to establish these agreements and documentation in place, and that includes the recording of the plat, and then hopefully the, the private cemetery comes into operation. Oops. The, just so you know that it was a broad-based, uh, in terms of the people involved, as Zara Centre, they had board and congregation representation, so we weren't going outside their bounds. Pete Peterson, the attorney, who has recently done some work with the, on some of these trustees and public and private cemeteries. Joel Brinkley, who's the cemetery general manager and funeral director within the Wyandotte County area. Uh, Chris McCord, who is, who is an appraiser, a local appraiser, so he was able to give us myself, and then PSI with the geotechs on this side, who again do a lot of work for us. Um, that's it, I'm open for questions. Um, as I said, Joel Brinkley, the funeral director, is here if we need to ask any questions, as is the Azara Centre. All right, Commissioner Bynum. The question I have is... Is your microphone on? No. Thank you. The question I have is $500 per burial plot for... Just for the maintenance, the long-term maintenance. maintenance. Does not include... I'm sorry, finish your question, I apologize. Times 150 plots, mm -hmm. $75,000. And I just, I guess my one and only concern is what authority would the unified government have over a private cemetery? I think I understood you to say that that money would be held. In escrow? For that purpose. For that purpose. Of maintaining. Um, that's right. In the event of the cemetery folding. Okay. And when that money was gone, because that just doesn't sound like very much money to me to maintain the cemetery. I'll ask Mr. Richardson to step in. Thank you. Uh, the intent would be that while the church is there and operating, that they would maintain that without touching that money. That money would be there in case in the future 
that the congregation would move and there would be no one there to maintain it or the congregation would go away, then that money and whatever interest it had earned over time would be available for us to use the theoretically the interest off that on an annual basis to maintain the cemetery. Because it is important, I think, to point out, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, I'll ask my legal staff to correct me if I'm wrong, I believe by state law, if a cemetery goes under, or as it were, um, if a cemetery uh, goes bankrupt, dies, or something, um, if a cemetery goes under, then it defaults back to the county to maintain. Is that right? Yes. And we currently maintain a number of formerly private cemeteries. They were more than adequately funded so the representative said at the time, but somehow the trust money always seems to disappear. So I think that's, um, so it is an apropos question in term, but the idea is the $75,000, when it's full, and if the congregation leaves and there's no one to care for it, that that money would go to the city in order, or the county in this case, um, the unified government to maintain. Does that answer your Mayor, the other thing would be that that agreement isn't drawn up yet, so we would have our attorneys work with Mr. Peterson to draw that up so that we would be protected and that the trust money couldn't be used without UG approval. Okay. Mr. Walker. I'm always a little bit curious when uh, groups make application or um, seek some kind of uh, special use permit, and then they never show. I mean, you're here. You're clearly not part of the congregation, I the, would think. As I've said, the, one of the board members. I'd like to ask them some questions. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah sir, come forward, please. My name is Jamil Aga. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of Azahara Center, and I live in Paola, Kansas. Has the Board of Trustees done any financial analysis by, Excuse me. by like a CPA or somebody to address the question of Commissioner Bynum? I, I too am a little concerned about the, I, I know it, it's a paltry amount when you're talking about maintaining a cemetery in perpetuity. Um, and that's, once it's there, it's going to be there forever. And as the mayor has indicated, we're, we are now obligated, the taxpayers of Wyandotte County are now obligated to take care of a certain number of cemeteries because the trust funds have uh, run out and there is no board any longer, whatever board there was has dissolved or disappeared. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not a financial analyst, but it does seem to be of a somewhat modest uh, amount to say to the commission, you're going to maintain this cemetery in perpetuity with $75,000. I, I, I don't see it happen. But so the question is, d did you have anybody run numbers for you as to what amount you should levy for Perpetuity. How does this compare to what? Well, I, I know what it compares to in, in terms of what I've paid for plots at other cemeteries, and it's not close. So, I would say, have you had any financial advice on what you should be charging? Uh, our attorney had done some research on what the initial, you know. Uh, amount should be set aside for, and he thought that was a very good number because he's spoken with other people in this business, and we took his uh, recommendation. If the, if the board has other recommendations, we'll definitely be. Uh, well, I mean, I'm not in a position to advise you on that. I'm, yeah. I'm just saying I, I am personally aware of what fee I had to pay for a couple of plots, and it was a lot more than what you're projecting. And I... I'm not any more certain they're going to maintain it in perpetuity than I am Absolutely. what you're charging. So, okay, thank you. Let, thank you. let me do this too, and we've got a, um, I started with questions, and I should have probably opened up the public hearing first and then come back to the questions. So I got a little um, 
little out of order here. So let's back up just a step. I have some other commissioners who have questions that they want to ask, and so I'm going to allow that to happen. Let's go ahead and open up the public hearing and hear if, any, if there are any other proponents who would like to speak in favor of this application at this time to please come forward. If you're in favor of this application, will you please come forward at this time? Mr. Brinkley, were you coming forward to speak in favor of this proposal? Joel Brinkley, 701 North 94th Street, Kansas City, Kansas. I came up to help out with um, Commissioner Walker's question. Um, that's pretty much in line. Uh, ECF Endowment Care Fund is what Chapel Hill pays because we're not a private cemetery. Uh, and it's 10% of what we sell a space for. So 500 is kind of high, actually, because there's I have very few spaces that are 5,000. Um, the reason the state of Kansas doesn't require the private cemeteries to do that is because they realistically, the, the chances of them ever being, a, being abandoned is very small because you're talking about a community who has reached out and these are their relatives and their friends. It's like your little church cemetery you find out in the counties. There might not be anything for miles, but there's somebody there that takes care of that cemetery every day. Um, so the, the, I believe that everybody's in agreement that the chances that that's ever going to happen is minimal. The reason it's more uh, feasible in a situation like Chapel Hill or Mount Calvary or Highland Park, those situations, is once all the spaces are sold and we have no more space to sell, there is no way to produce the income, which they will still have a community that produces income through tithes and things like that. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor of this proposal? I see no one coming forward. Anyone who would like to speak in opposition to this proposal, will you please come forward at this time? I see no one coming forward to speak in opposition. We'll now close the public. Would you like to come speak in opposition? My name is Michael Baska, resident at uh, 6300 Parallel Parkway. Um, I came in opposition to this. I'm highly against it because of, um, well, from what I understood from the last meeting, which I've tried to get minutes on too online, I've not been able to get. Um, but from what I've gotten from the last one is that I've heard that the caskets are made for water flow to flow through. That is not true um, from what I've been, I live in a funeral home family um, and drilling holes is not common practice. I'm also worried about the groundwater contamination. I heard there are only two soil samples versus the eight to nine, and that there was water found at 10 feet, so there's only a four foot gap. And if you look at the weather going on now, I mean, you can look at Houston, their graves are popping out of the ground, so that shows that there's no uh, holes that drill through. Uh, that's also desecration of a body, desecration of a grave. Um, the air pollution and the soil degeneration, if there's no tarp or any encasing around that, um, there's nothing that I've heard that, um, that of any process of anybody checking on any bodies with communicable diseases, uh, if they have anything that can catch on, you know, uh, it's got a rec Kansas law states by the Kansas State Board of Mortuary Arts that that requires encapsulation. And that's got to be checked um, before burial. So I haven't heard anything of that. From what I understand, that's a directly ground burial. There's no encapsulation. So I'm really concerned of when the body uh, decomposes. In 30 days, it's going to get into the soiled water. And, it, and I've also know that when a cemetery is put in, it's normally not, it doesn't, it does change the, oh, it changes the property value. It decreases it actually quite a bit from my understanding from what I've seen. Um, and that's basically what I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in opposition? All right, I will close the public hearing and give the applicant an opportunity to respond if the applicant would like to respond. I included in the packets that you got there that uh, the community plans on using a funeral home to facilitate the burials there in the cemetery. And it's up to the individual funeral home and the licensed funeral director to know what 
to do if in K in the rare case that there would be something that would be communicable or contagious and um, I also um, the Kansas does have a requirement to notify the funeral home if a person's been uh, diagnosed with a communicable or contagious disease so we're aware of that and the two options yes in that case become either to embalm the person or to encat or to encase them in a hermetically sealed box which would they would need to choose one of those two options if that were the case it's not up to the community to do that it's up to the licensed funeral director to know that which you know you have to you have to call a funeral home anyway the the community couldn't process a death certificate themselves anyway without a funeral home involved there would be no death certificate there would be no record to be able to get insurance things like that so um, as far as the holes um, uh, Mr. Baska wasn't at the meeting. I think he's heard it second, third, maybe fourth hand. What I was saying is uh, some of the, and, and I'm sure he's familiar with Clark vaults, I would hope, that have no bottom in them, you know, and there are the lower, the, the lower cost out of barrel containers. What they do, they do have openings in the bottom to let the water back out as it comes in. Otherwise, the box would become filled with water and never drain out, so. The reason that is is the purpose of an outer barrel container is not necessarily to encapsulate or hold anything in or anything out. The main purpose of an outer barrel container, the reason we were required at Chapel Hill is strictly landscaping purposes. It's because if it's designed to hold all the weight of the earth, and if we didn't have that, eventually the, the ground would cave in and we'd have to come in after the grass is already growing and the sod was established and put new dirt and new grass down. And not required. Um, is, can you might remind me if there was a cover? I think that's fine. All right. So with that, we will close the public hearing and now open it back up to commissioners for discussion. Commissioner Johnson. Uh, I'd like to preface my comments and question uh, with due respect to the uh, Muslim community and uh, appreciation for the need to have a, lo a location to, to properly bury their, their, their dead. Um, but I share in the same uh, concern relative to the perpetuity of the operations, particularly the management of said facility. Uh, and we know that there's uh, a fund that will be established, and I agree with uh, comments that have been made by Commissioners Bynum and Walker relative to what I would consider a, um, a, a meager uh, amount even at $75,000, how long would that, that, that last? There seems to be, to be some predisposition towards the, dis, the dissolution of, this or, of, of said facility or cemetery. And with that in mind, it, it, it makes me wonder why there, and maybe it's just putting the cart before the horse, uh, why there were not numbers to kind of justify this that were provided with this packet um, and, and, and so it causes me to ask the question, even at 150 plots that you're saying over 75 years, four burials per year, is that really, is there really a market for uh, this type of facility uh, to support that? And the congregation, is this one congregation or is this multiple congregations that we'll be looking to as the market to be able to um, to, to continue to have this going on so that we don't have this discussion about um, uh, whether or not the, 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 the county can, can support this. We, I don't think we should even be having that discussion. If that's part of the discussion, I, think, I don't know that we need to be even talking about this. So um, there needs to be uh, data that would support uh, the, the, the perpetuity of this and just by using numbers such as $500 times 150, I don't think that really cuts it. So, uh, do you? How, what what data are you utilizing to justify that there really is a market for uh, for this type of facility? Would you like them to come forward and answer the question? Yes, please. I'll ask the applicant to step forward and answer the question in terms of what market you think supports this. Will Anderson again. The, the issue is the difficulty of the, the goal was to provide an Islamic cemetery 
that meets their requirements. Um, the set aside of the $500, how the $500 was judged, was basically upon using the same parameters that they used for a public cemetery, where the, the figures are much higher. Um, the figures that we have set are basically set by that parameter. If there's how to judge that figure, if the 75,000, if the church is there, they are maintaining that that amount is not touched. The 75,000 basically continues to grow as the, the people are, are buried. I guess the danger is that if, if the cemetery folds before all are buried, then you don't end up with the, the $75,000. But in essence, the, um, the other things to consider is that it, it is one of the only Islamic cemeteries, would be one of the only Islamic cemeteries available through it. The, to maintain the private cemetery aspect of it, the aim was to basically keep it within the congregation and the close family members. It wasn't to be opened up to the general public because it was not a public cemetery. It was not aimed to be a public cemetery. Now I realise the, the, the number $75,000 may seem small, but if it's held in basically under the control of both the UG as a signatory on the, the account or the trustee account and the, the board on the other side, then there's that amount there. Uh, in terms of how long that would maintain it, I'm not sure how you could judge that. Because, it, but basically, it's a it becomes similar to a family cemetery, or similar to as Mr. Brinkley said, like the country cemeteries, they are still maintained no matter who is there, just because of the family history of these places. Okay. All right, Commissioner Kane. Well, obviously, I'm not the religious leader of this group. But, you know, I read this thing, we get to pack it on Monday, and I read it twice on Monday because I thought it was unusual that a uh, religion wanted to take care of their folks in their very religious way and to honor the body by burying it in, in what they consider it, it going on to a, a better place. And uh, uh, then I made sure that all this stuff fell inside the state guidelines you know, as I was looking at it, because I've never seen anything like this before. And uh, I mean, as I'm reading it, there's they, they put a shroud over them. The, the females get five pieces, the males get uh, three pieces. And I don't know if this cemetery is ever going to fill, but I sure would like if, if, if I had a religion like that, that I could be buried right by my church, right with my family, right where they would want me to be. Where every time I go to church service, if I wanted to walk out the back, I could go see them. And uh, I go see my mom a lot. It's about 25 miles away. It sure would be handy to just walk out back one of the churches and say, mom's back there. So uh, I know this is unusual. It's completely unusual. And uh, I would be for something like this. All right, I will ask Mr. Bach um, to speak to the issue of maintenance. Uh, Mayor, our current cemeteries that we have, about a 12 to 13 that we maintain in the county now, as you noted earlier per um, state statute, requires counties to take them over when they've been abandoned. Um, we spend a rate at about $1,000 an acre. We contract for most of them today, so that's, that's our cost. Um, the $75,000 that they've placed in trust is one if it all depends on what kind of interest rate you're going to get because assuming you need to put an amount of money in trust that would you would never touch the principal on it um, but if you were doing all you know this is 3.79 acres so if you had a 5% interest rate you would get approximately enough to cover that okay. right. based on $1,000 an acre based on $1,000 an acre, and then you would assume, you know, your money probably grows a little bit. We don't have a cost of living index that hits us at 5% a year for the cost of mowing. So assuming it would build probably beyond that amount for a principal base over and above what cost of living would be a year. So this, um, I'm not sure, we haven't set out anything as far as this agreement where this money goes from a trust and it all goes in at that point. 
uh, long-term investment, we could probably hit that kind of interest rate, and there would probably be enough there that it, this seems like it would be close to that amount, but it's nothing we've ever projected before. Okay. Commissioner Bynum. I'd like to make a motion for approval. Second. All right. It has been moved and seconded. I see no one else uh, wishing to speak on the commission. Roll call. Roll call. Walters. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Walker. Aye. Townsend. Aye. McKiernan. Aye. Lugia. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Kane. Aye. Markley. Aye. The vote is nine to zero. That motion carries. All right. Thank you very much. That concludes our planning and zoning items. That brings us now to our non-planning consent agenda. Um, those items are before you. Anyone, Second. anyone who would like to set an item aside may do so at this time. Any item not set aside will be voted on at one time. Is there anyone now who would like to set an item aside? Let the record show no one is moving forward to set an item aside. Roll call. Roll call. Walters. Aye. Bynum. Aye. Walker. Aye. Townsend. Aye. McKiernan. Aye. Mugia. Aye. Johnson. Aye. Kane. Aye. Markley. Aye. The vote is 9-0. to zero. That motion carries. I will say now, um, I didn't want to pull it off the consent agenda, but included in this consent agenda was an a grant application um, by our police department to look for body-worn cameras for our police department. Um, that's an issue we've been looking into. The commission agreed that it's something we're interested in, um, but we're going to need some financial help to make it happen. And so we are, this begins the process. It was the next, I think the next day after the commission had the conversation that the grant application became available through the Department of Justice. So we will, um, we're now applying for that grant. Should we receive that grant, we will ask uh, uh, Chief Ziegler to um, put together a program to help us understand the full cost because the cost of the cameras are only the beginning of the costs um, in terms of implementing such a program. Um, but I, th I have gone on record to say I would be fully supportive of leading the region in the implementation of this new technology to protect our uh, sworn officers um, as well as our citizens. So it holds great potential. It's not the end all be all, but it holds great potential. and that application was on the consent agenda all right that brings us to our last item let me make sure it's our last item it is our last item which is the um, commissioner's agenda the casino grant funds um, i'll ask joe connor to make presentation thank you mayor commissioners uh, what you have before you tonight is a, a summary spreadsheet of every application received uh, the requested amount and then the amounts that were awarded by by you individually um, just a way of summary, there were 54 total applications received this year. Um, there are 33 grants being recommended for approval with the average being almost $15,000 per grant. Um, I'll stand for any questions. Uh, and, and I guess uh, if, if approved, this will be posted on the UG website next week with every application that was received so people can look and see what grants were submitted and uh, what, what they were about and what you funded uh, as well. All right, is there any discussion? Second. It has been moved and seconded. Seeing no uh, comment, roll call. Roll call, Walters? Aye. Bynum? Aye. Walker? Aye. Townsend? Aye. McKiernan? Aye. Mugia? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Kane? Aye. Markley? Aye. The vote is nine to zero, that motion carries. All right, that concludes our agenda tonight. Mayor, can I make a quick announcement? Yes. I just want to make sure all the commissioners are aware that on June 2nd, the CDBG committee is going to meet at 4 p.m. You're all welcome. We'll be on the fifth floor, and we are you'll get a notice about it. But just so you know, we're meeting with our consultant for the five-year plan that day and um, wanted to make sure that you were aware that that's your opportunity to meet with that consultant and talk about our five-year plan. That's on June 2nd. I would make this special request. Please let Janet or... Uh, Deanna, no, in your office, if you're going to attend, because if we go to five, we need to announce that meeting. 
So we just want to make sure that we yeah. we have we've already announced them. Yeah, meeting? we've been announcing them anyway. Okay, so. so you don't need to RSVP, but you're welcome to go. Totally optional to be clear, but you're more than welcome to join us. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, we are adjourned. Well, how about that setup? Uh -huh. Well, it is boring. Does this go back to? There's back a reason. Or do I have to do something to make it? Well, <laughs> <laughs> it's very. Interesting.